But we're going to hear from DIU's newest portfolio, Advanced Energy and Materials, who is dedicated to tackling DOD's growing energy needs. So joining us on our panel this afternoon, we have first Mr. Doug French. He is the Tactical Vehicle Electrification Program Manager at DIU's Advanced Energy and Materials Portfolio. Joining him will be Jonathan Villasenor, who is the Maneuver Chief at the U.S. Army, as well as Lee Robinson, a member of DIU's Advanced Energy and Materials Portfolio. I'd like to bring all three of them up and join us on our panel today. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to take a step back and let you take the uh, take their helm. Great. Thanks, Bobby. It's a pleasure to meet everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks uh, for joining our discussion on powering our future. It's going to be a look into operational energy in the military and how we're going to use how we're going to power our force both today uh, in the near future and then in the not so distant future. For those of you who are not familiar with the domain, operational energy is the term we use to refer to how we power our force in the field. From the warfighter on the ground, to our planes, ships, and vehicles, to our bases in the field, they all require power. And that power, immense power, um, has energy requirements that are growing. Uh, so our discussion today is going to focus on how new ways that we can incorporate uh, to generate, distribute, and use that power to answer those growing requirements. Um, as Bobby mentioned, I'm Lee Robinson. I'm with DIU's Advanced Energy and Materials Portfolio. Fortunate enough to be joined by two colleagues that are deep in the space. With me is my DIU colleague, Lieutenant Colonel Doug French. He's our head program manager for our operational energy portion of our portfolio. We're also joined by Army Future Command's Lieutenant Colonel John Villasenor. John is a maneuver chief at AFC's Maneuver Aviation Soldier Lethality and Robotics Division. Thank you both for joining today. Before we jump in to operational energy, let me make one admin note. We'll be taking some questions at the tail end of the session. So if you have a question, please feel free to put it into the chat. Also gonna be monitoring a Slack channel if you wanna put it there. Back to operational energy. I wanna start our question, so we start our discussion with a question over to Doug. Doug, it seems like every single day I read a new article about battery unicorns or billion dollar fundraises for energy or climate tech, considering Defense Innovation Unit is the sole joint organization focused on understanding the current trends in the commercial sector um, and accessing new technologies from non-traditional vendors. Can you help us make sense of what's happening in operational energy in the private sector? What are the funds, uh, yeah, sure. where are the funds uh, being in invested and what are the trends for energy? Sure, I'll, uh, I'll certainly do my best here. Uh, thanks a lot for having me on here. Um, so uh, like you said, you know, at DIU, we leverage uh, private sector research and development trends and, uh, and the market to move quickly to solve problems faced by the defense community and our troops, but also to expand the uh, defense industrial base. So it really behooves us to know, you know what those trends are. Uh, specifically in my, my portfolio, uh, Advanced Energy Materials, we're, we are following trends in uh, obviously the energy sector. So. Um, and so really what that means, you know, what does that mean? And so, you know, the, uh, the <laughs> really it's uh, billions and billions of dollars right now are being, are pouring into the business of decarbonization writ large. Um, I'll talk about kind of the, the greater investing trends here up front and then get into some of the, some of the specifics a little bit later on. But uh, so the International Energy you know, Agency calculates that new patents related to core tech like batteries, hydrogen, smart grids, anything carbon capture, they're outpacing, far outpacing any other technology, including even like fossil fuel, software, um, things like that. So um, money has followed that innovation. Um, Bloomberg, we all know, figures that last year investors poured more than like $500 billion into quote energy transition, which is uh, decarbonizing everything from energy and trans decarbonizing energy and you know transport to, uh, to industry, even things like farming. So which is like twice as much as it was 10 years ago in 2010. Uh, PwC estimates that between 2013 and 2020, VC investments in climate tech grew five times the rate of global startup funding overall. So lots of money pouring in here. Uh, in 2020, these investments uh, <clears throat> made up about $60 billion in the U.S. alone, up from $36 billion just last year in 2020. So climate tech uh, makes up about a tenth of new investments made by uh, Sequoia Capital, the major Silicon Valley VC firm. Um, 
So uh, some of the uh, some of the bigger names out there have just been um, moving in. A, a guy named Chris Saka of uh, Lowercase Capital, who's invested in certain you know companies like uh, um, Uber, made made early investments in Uber, Instagram, Twitter, things like that. Said he'd launch a climate tech fund, a VC fund worth about eight hundred million dollars. Um, DBL Partners is another big uh, VC uh, company. Reports that uh, you know in two thousand four they were scraping together maybe seventy five million dollars for clean tech. They're going to raise. They've already raised uh, about six hundred million dollars, and they had to cut it off. So lots of money flowing in, um, and not only just from VCs. Um, they also include uh, you know philanthrop philanthropists like Bill Gates, uh, Wall Street, and uh, big business, um, of course, and uh, you know state sponsored energy or state sponsored funds as well. Um, in August, the Department of Energy announced they'd give a billion and a half. A, they announced a billion and a half dollar partnership with uh, Breakthrough Energy which is part of that network founded by Bill Gates, which includes things like Breakthrough Energy Ventures. Uh, it aims to accelerate development of novel tech and sustainable aviation fuel, green hydrogen, direct air capture, and long-term energy storage. So this augments the 20 billion loan program that DOE is already avail has available to boost clean energy and transport. Uh, banks, even banks, you know, traditionally really conservative investors have jumped in this as well. Um, for instance, JP Morgan now has, de has dedicated employees who focus solely on climate tech and green issues. Um, it's interesting, they're actually making some smaller loans as well to pre revenue firms um, in the sector and will expand into uh, bridging that finance between VC and uh, project financing for capital intensive initiatives. Um, so that's, you know, that's always a difficult spot for uh, for companies to uh, that bridge for um, young startups to cross over. Uh, many corporate giants are going beyond like commitments, like nebulous marketing promises, right? Like being being green and net zero corporate pledges, et cetera, by investing. So they're investing directly into uh, climate tech. Uh, between 2017 and 2020, um, they were actually they invested $58 billion in, in this at all. So um, putting their money where their mouth is. So I'm up here in Seattle. So uh, we've got Microsoft and uh, Amazon up here. Microsoft uh, just, uh, you know, which we all know last year just vowed to remove all the greenhouse gases they've ever emitted um, going back to their founding and more um, they're gonna do that by 2050 they just sent up a billion dollar climate tech fund as well amazon just launched one worth like two billion dollars focused entirely uh, or financed entirely from its own balance sheet so they're not really even uh, holding investments to uh, internal any internal rates of return they're just investing in it's not it was more of a almost like a grant so their focus really is on decarbonization which amazon views as a as a strategic need for their for their business, so they're measuring success by how much uh, how much investments reduce the carbon footprint, rather by uh, by their rather than by their rate of return. Uh, within DoD ourselves here, um, we have the National Security Innovation Capital, which is part of DIU. Um, it's uh, charged with um, with funding uh, early stage early stage ventures um, that are focused more on the hardware tech, which is sometimes more difficult to uh, for companies to get. So last year they invested fifteen million dollars in that longer term uh, hardware focused tech, including a lot of alternative energy uh, uh, sources. So all this to say that the the market writ large, from VCs to banks, corporations, states, private investors, even even Coke Industries, uh, the fossil fuel loving uh, private industry um, a private equity firm. They uh, they're fully invested, literally and figuratively, into like all forms of climate tech. Um, so as such, you know the DoD is taking notice and is starting to follow suit. Um, DoD is starting to really strategize and invest in carbon uh, reducing tech. Um, without stealing too much of John's thunder here, you know we're we're doing this both for uh, humanitarian reasons, right? It's the right thing to do um, for for everyone, um, and it also follows directly, you know, the uh, Biden administration's guidance, but also for uh, makes sense strategically and tactically, right? Um, Strategically and economic sense for the DoD as it transitions to uh, clean energy, uh, it extends our operational capability. We can you know, generate power closer to the heart of uh, area of operations, almost like a uh, like edge computing for uh, energy, and it allows for uh, you know forward units to you know soldiers, air, airmen, marines, sailors to operate free uh, from the shackles of fossil fuel, which is you know the, the old quote from uh, former Secretary of Defense James Mattis, uh, it frees up uh, our resources for other uses as well. Um, so really the, uh, the market is investing in anything related to, you know, to summarize, you know, the market is investing in anything related to decarbonizations and several areas happen to cross over into, uh, to DOD needs. Uh, the, the areas that we're really focused on right now are include operational range enhancement, anything from like hybrid, hybrid tech, which is something I'm involved with right now, uh, hybridizing, uh, tactical vehicles for the, uh, army and the Marine 
for. And uh, certainly EV batteries, um, Tesla, GM, Ford, all the big players have invested billions and billions into uh, into electronic or to electric vehicle uh, power and battery. Um, and we need to follow suit. And then fuel, you know, anything from fuel cells and alternative and on-site energy generation from like hydrogen, biofuel, air capture, et cetera. So, so the market is is certainly moving this direction, and the DoD is uh, following suit. Thanks, Doug. That's that's helpful, and it's pretty clear that, uh, like you just mentioned, the market sees that this is a high priority, um, and it's good to hear that the the DoD is also focusing on it as a high priority. But, um, John, can you help us understand what's the reason why? Why is uh, operational energy a strategic concern? And then, uh, second, you know, second question is uh, those trends that Doug mentioned. I imagine they're going to have an impact on uh, the DoD at some point in the future. Can you help us understand what the battle space will look like maybe 10 years from now, maybe in 2035 for operational energy? Uh, yeah, I'll try to make an attempt at uh, answering both of those. Uh, and so first off, good afternoon. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you, to everybody. The, uh, as I was said, I'm the maneuver chief over at MASD and, and FCC, and we are um, tagged to be the lead for the Army's operational energy strategy. So um, I, this is actually a great forum to kind of like put some of the ideas out there and, and possibly have a conversation. Um, the slide that is currently up, and I'll orient you to real quick. Um, so the the top or the the big bullets on the outside of the circle are kind of like what the army is looking at um, as as serious conflict and something that we have to solve uh, moving into the future. So soldier energy, um, we understand that that demand is going to go up. Base camp or some type of infrastructure, especially operating in an expeditionary austere environment. Um, so we're thinking microgrids, energy source and distribution that's going towards storage um, and power distribution and then vehicle energy demands, uh, understanding that regardless of the powertrain, there, there, there's going to be an uh, energy demand. Um, and then what that Venn diagram currently in the middle is kind of like, is, is how all of those things overlap. Um, and again, if, if energy, which is not currently a domain, is a domain that facilitates all the other domains within the MDO or a multi-domain operation environment, um, this would be kind of what it, it looks like, right? There's mission, a geographic and an environmental aspect uh, that influences um, everything that that the Army will encounter uh, in, in a future conflict. Um, and so my background, you know, to answer the first question is whether and why is energy a strategic concern? It's because everything requires energy. And that's what this slide kind of depicts um, to include the soldier. Right. Uh, he, he demands uh, class one upload, right? So food and water in order to get the energy for him, for him to move. And his personal weapon then becomes, the, you know, carried and he becomes the platform for that weapon system and all the other capabilities that he will carry. So everything on the battlefield as of right now and forever will require energy of some kind. Um, so I'm an armor guy um, and it takes about 500 gallons to fuel my tank. Um, I understand that if I do not plan correctly and I do not use my energy efficiently, at some point my tank, which is extremely lethal, will become a bunker, right? It becomes a static, non-moving bunker um, with no operational reach and, and little to no capability. Um, and then at some point my bunker turns into a coffin um, and that's bad, right? And not just a tactical and operational problem, but strategically as well. Because if I'm running out of fuel, that means my organization is, and 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 it continues to disrupt uh, further up the chain. So, energy, it is definitely a strategic concern. It powers all vehicles, aircraft, ships, communication suites, protective systems, electrical devices, and weapons. The energy demand will only increase as we implement and operationalize future technological innovations into the military. It becomes a strategic goal then to have a ready and secured energy where we need it, when we need it, and in the form we need it in. Without operational energy considerations, a modern army is very quickly reduced to horse, wind, and foot power. Um, so we basically go back in time without, the, uh, without operational energy considerations implemented in our planning. Um, today and in the foreseeable future, 
operational energy essential to our ability to project combat forces globally. This makes operational energy a critical element in all strategic planning considerations and must be resourced and integrated effectively within our war plans. A military's ability to control or exploit energy opportunities or leverage a nation's ability to transport it has determined success or failure to prosecute warfare throughout history. A way to ensure success is to view operation energy not as an enabler, but as a domain that integrates and facilitates the other domains within multi-domain operations. Operational energy is the ecosystem that manages all energy sources. The Army is evolving from a historic framework that viewed resource considerations as constraints on operational effectiveness to a perspective that considers the critical role of energy as a means to mission success. The United States predominance is being challenged across all domains to include operational energy. If our ability to get energy into a contested area is denied, then it quickly becomes a strategic issue as our political objectives may not be achieved through a military solution. If our near peer and peer competitors sense that the US hard power capability was limited or non-existent due to energy constraints, then our ability to affect others to gain a preferred outcome would be threatened, putting us at a serious disadvantage at best and, and empowering our competitors to act against us at worst. Additional strategic concerns are our weapon systems. Uh, we are a force that can project global, globally, which means extended lines of communication. It takes more strategic lift, boats and aircraft to move supplies while under threat from anti-access and area denial weapon systems. These systems have increased in capability and are extremely lethal and will create multiple dilemmas across multiple domains. These systems will only become more efficient and the proliferation to all of our competitors is guaranteed. Another aspect of the strategic uh, or a, a concern for the um, uh, for energy in the strategic realm is technology and manufacturing demand for global resources. They will only increase and they are, and I'm talking specifically to rare earth elements, which may cause the accumulation and deployment of military power to secure it. All the technological advances in the past 20 years relies heavily on rare earth elements for de development and production. These elements are called rare, not because of a lack of abundance, but the limited number of sources you can exploit. Further innovations and technological advancements will require these elements, and without them, our ability to manufacture and produce them may be limited. My point is that fuel that we pour into our gas tanks on its own creates a strategic problem on how we get it there, where we need it, when we need it, in the form we need it in. The strategic perspective needs to be broadened when we discuss energy security because it includes the materials that create the technology that will carry and secure it and the locations they exist in. All right, so the second part of the, the, the uh, question, what will energy, the energy domain look like in 2030 and 2035? Um, what you have in front of you is, is, and I'll just really quickly orient you, is kind of a glide path. Uh, so a maneuver uh, seated down at Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, just had the ELRV, uh, electric light reconnaissance vehicle, uh, abbreviated CDD, uh, just get approved. Uh, so what that means is that the Army is going to invest um, in, in this prototype, and it's going to start with the war gaming. Uh, so maneuver battle lab down at Benning will start the simulations and, and, and start to determine, and all that data will start to determine how they prototype. Um, and you can see in the near term, 20, 23 through 27, and then midterm, 28 through 37, and then far term, 38 to 50. Uh, but it's really 38 plus. That glide path kind of, and then you can see the big uh, overarching uh, arrows underneath the big arrow, um, kind of like depicts the glide path that the Army is going to use. We're not tied to this. Obviously, we're just going to use this as a handrail. This is all tied under the tactical vehicle electric ICD, which is currently going through the process of being uh, staffed and then hopefully approved. Uh, what that will do is align all the tactical and combat vehicles within the Army. Uh, on, a, on a path towards the transformation from a fossil fuel to some type of alternative energy. Right now, the way it's depicted, the ELRV will be fully electric, uh, starting with a hybrid hybridization in the near term and then transitioning over to a fully electric in the mid to the far term. Um, the reason for electric um, is because we feel that the, um, the technology has been is mature uh, and that this is a feasible, viable, and accessible way forward for the Army. And then on the far left are, are different forms of energy, 
um, that we'll talk to you here in a second. Um, so we must so we must decrease uh, unit reliance on fossil fuels, petroleum products, and parts. There's there's two reasons for that. One, it, it keeps the logistics footprint smaller. Um, and it, what I kind of laid out is in an A2AD or area access, area denial environment, the future battlefield is going to be extremely lethal. Um, the capabilities that are currently being fielded and future capabilities are going to be able to reach out longer, further, and have a more devastating effect uh, on targets. Um, and, and there's nowhere to hide, right? So as, as UAS becomes more prolific, um, more sensors in, in terms of a ubiquitous sensor field, um, as we try to gain access into, into controlled space, um, we, we will always, they will always know where we're at. The ISR piece, uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets uh, are only going to get better, uh, especially if they're on the defense and we're, we're trying to actually uh, penetrate. So having said all that, the lines of communication, the things that need to move along those routes uh, to push supplies forward are going to be attrited. Um, and so that is a problem set that the army is trying to solve. And one of the ways to solve that is to frame it through the lens of energy security. And if I was to secure energy, then I have to reduce that footprint, knowing that there's going to be an increased demand of energy on the far end. And, and that's the rub. So that means we have to transition the army to an alternative energy. Um, and, and I kind of laid out ELRV. Um, right now, because of the technological maturity, it's going to be a hybridization. Um, so, you know, at certain miles per hour, it will it will kick into a fuel based, and then a yeah, fuel based with a drivetrain, and then at certain decreased speeds, um, it'll go electric. There will also be anti anti idle uh, capabilities um, because a lot of the force when we're static, uh, we need our systems up because we're continuing to observe. Um, and and, and anti-idle seems to be the way forward. So there's mature technology uh, at a TRL six within the in, within industry that we can implement and and operationalize now. Um, and this will increase unit operational reach endurance uh, compared to a combustible engine. Uh, this will also provide commanders at all levels the ability to conduct signature management, uh, acoustic and thermal, that will make them more lethal at the point of contact. And then there's the parts piece. Um, if we go to a hybrid and then fully electric, obviously we don't need a combustible engine anymore, an internal combustible engine. Um, so that entire space is now free for, you know, additional ammunition or for whatever soldier needs there are. Um, or we make the vehicle smaller and lighter, uh, giving it more capability um, in terms of reach and, and the terrain that it can travel upon. Um, and then the logistics piece, if there was two things that tie logistics up, it's the parts and fuel. So having no parts and no fuel moving forward, um, I, I mean, it, one, it frees up that commander, uh, you know, that division through battalion level commander to exploit and to maneuver freely, um, knowing that he's not tied to his logistics or to a logistics train. Um, the slide also depicts the way forward for electrification. Uh, I kind of laid that out and, and the tag VE. Um, John, other... thank you for walking us through this. Yeah. Uh, and it looks like the, the broad way forward for the Army is to electrify the entire battle space. Um, and I'm glad you, you touched on one area where we may be able to tie in with industry. Uh, Doug, uh, what about the, what, what can we do, say, in the next one, two, three years to get closer to how industry is electrifying the entire personal vehicle space? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, backboning on what John just said, right? The uh, the army's doing some great work with platforms like the ELRV to electrify the battle space, which really is the future. Um, but you know, the army, the DoD is a large organization. It's a it's a big behemoth that takes a long time to turn. So even if we make the decision right now, which we are starting to to say we are going to electrify completely 100%, it's going to take a long time. So we're you know that point. So we have that point right of where we're at right now with our legacy systems and the point we're trying to get to in the future, which is like kind of you know this fully electrified battle space. But we have time and and legacy systems that we that exist currently. So it's it's things like uh, it's working on things like you know 
technology to get us from here to there in the most expedient and efficient manner. So right now, uh, for instance, um, John mentioned the uh, hybridization and idle, which is uh, something that we are working with at, at DIU, we're working with the Army's uh, PM transportation systems to hybridize uh, a series of their tactical vehicles, starting with the uh, the FMTV, which is like the 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 medium tactical vehicle. It's just a, it's a it's a transport truck. It's not sexy, but it's ubiquitous. It's the backbone of the Army. The Army has 67,000 of them. So you can see it would take a long time to phase those out. So we're working on a, a project right now to prototype uh, hybridization of those um, of those trucks um, utilizing. Uh, we've, we've partnered with two uh, with with two commercial uh, companies who are experts in this field who have been doing this uh, TRL nine technology, have been uh, putting this technology onto fleets, um, civilian uh, trucking fleets over over time. So. Uh, to re in order to reduce that uh, that carbon footprint and, and the, the reliance on fossil fuels, so uh, we you know we we figured that uh, these these vehicles, like John said, you know they, they've got to run at idle full time in order to power onboard systems. They're spending up upwards of sixty percent of their time idling. So if we can uh, mitigate that, that is a you know that's a, a potential uh, you know sixty percent fuel savings and a sixty percent operational increase. So those are, those are the kinds of technology we're looking at at, at things like DIU. Is just bolting on and finding ways to um, introduce uh, commercial technology onto those legacy systems, whether it be tactical vehicle hybridization or an effort that uh, some of my, my colleagues are working with to standardize battery, you know, um, private sector batteries across the uh, across the DoD, or adding hydrogen fuel cells onto uh, long distance uh, craft that already exist. So just uh, uh, kind of bridging that gap between where we are right now and what we're trying to get to. That's a significant, I think you mentioned uh, upwards of 30, 20, 30% fuel savings just purely from hybridization. That's that's significant fuel yeah. savings. Uh, it goes a long way to um, unhooking the tether uh, that we have right now to fossil fuels. But, you know, um, we can't wait for 15 years. Um, and it's good to hear that we have things happening in the next one, two, three years. But what are we going to do in the next five, six years, John, to, to further unhook that tether? That's a good question. And so the, uh, um, the, the buzzword, at least in my building, right? So in futures, uh, concepts and, and command, the, uh, the, the, it's, it's the idea of you know, let's not throw new money at old things. Um, uh, to not, uh, continue to buy incrementally better versions of platforms that, that, that originated back in the eighties. Um, and I, I think the army is struggling with that, right? That, that, that capability was designed, uh, and, and it was designed well to fight a, 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 uh, an enemy that may or may not exist for us right now. Um, and as we try to see how we can become lighter, uh, and more expeditionary, um, these, these legacy systems, um, are, are starting to become an anchor for us, right? And so, you know, th there's the fight right now is the, the the biggest rub is the modernization piece versus maintaining the systems that we currently have, right? To make them relevant on, on today's battlefield. And so those are the issues, right? So to answer your question, the next five to 10 years, um, you're, you're gonna start seeing an, a, an actual push and in, in investment in leap ahead next generation systems. Uh, invest in, alternative and renewable energy solutions uh, for future tactical and, and, and combat vehicles. Um, we're going to start looking at investing in key technologies. Uh, we understand that a lot of things have to culminate simultaneously with our ability to transition to alternative energy. And some of those are power generation, power storage, power distribution, and, and power management. Um, and, and a part of that that's not that's not listed is to give the ability uh, for soldiers and platforms to monitor usage and, and to you know to actually change behaviors. Um, that is another thing you'll probably see in the next five to ten years is this idea that fuel and energy is not infinite. Um, again, I'm a tanker, so I didn't care about fuel because a fueler always showed up, um, and it only became a problem. When they didn't show up, which never happened, so we have to get out. We have to get out of this mindset that it's always going to show up. Thanks, uh, John. To... Okay. Thanks, John. So I'm hearing yes, uh, that we're going to be seeing huge revisions to how we generate, distribute, uh, and monitor our usage of energy. Really excited uh, developments. I want to say thank you both.
to walking us through that modernization strategy. Um, I'll hand it back off to uh, to Bobby uh, to set up for the the next event. <laughs>